rate that I assume that it has not been a, a problem thus far and hopefully will not be a problem. You haven't seen an unusual amount of fish kills or? We, we have had a tremendous number of fish kills primarily in the upper reaches of the estuary, in the freshwater streams and so on, uh, following the storm due to, and, and what the health people told me was lack of oxygen, the tremendous amount of, 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 the of and stuff. Plant, way, uh, right. plant things that went in, and, and, and the waters are warm, low oxygen carrying capacity, and, and there have been some fish kills, yes, sir. Okay. All right, I, I thank you very much for your patience on that. And Mr. Mr. Gilchrist, do uh, you have any questions to the panel? I do, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I have a series of questions, so. We uh, look like we're, we're it, so. Uh, I may go over my time. I, I, that's, we that's, can bounce back and forth. That's permitted. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I, um, I was going to ask uh, Mr. Parrott some questions, but I'll, I'll get back. I'll go back to Mr. Parrott later. Um, when, uh, well, I, since you came back up, um, Mr. Parrott, I just want to know if you were, and I, I can't remember now if I asked this the last time before we left for our votes. I wrote it down. I don't know if I asked it. Um, in and, and this does not have to do with the reauthorization of the Magnuson Act, but since you're here from are you from Mississippi or Louisiana? Um, I am living in, in Mississippi now. I, I also have a home and, and property in Louisiana because I am originally from Louisiana. Oh, I, I retired from the uh, Department of Wildlife and Fisheries after 30 years. I was director of oh. fisheries, and now I'm director of fisheries in Mississippi. Real. That's interesting. Um, so this question then is probably not apt for you to answer because it deals with the restoration of coastal Louisiana and the process that, that's now undertaking um, it, to do that. And we up here in Washington, I've been down to Louisiana a couple of different times in the last month or so, um, partly to look at the destruction, partly to take a look at the restoration efforts in coastal Louisiana and how that's going to um, and how that process is going so that we as members of Congress, when we vote for these appropriations, uh, will have some better sense of, of um, how, it all, how it's all going to work. Uh, but since you're not in, you don't live in Louisiana, um, this might not be an apt question. The question I have, though, is um, the, the delegation from Louisiana has asked for about $250 billion for just Louisiana. Of that, I believe it's about $14 billion for the restoration of the coastal areas. But there's nothing really in that bill uh, specific about that $14 billion and how it's going to be spent and the amount of protection that will result from that. And I guess I, I was wondering, since fisheries is such a major part of coastal Louisiana, um, how much is the Gulf Coast Council involved or can participate in the process that is now underway to develop a restoration plan that will be specific in how those, whether, whatever the amount will finally come out to be, 8 billion, 10 billion, 14 billion, over, I don't know, it's a very long period of time. I'm interested in that because I was down there and for one day we went through a great deal of science about the restoration and it said without a restoration project, by 2050, you'd lose 500 square miles of coastal Louisiana. With the restoration, you'd save about half that. You'd still lose about 250 square miles of coastal Louisiana. So, um, and we can probably talk about this at some other point, but are the fisheries folks in any way involved in the process to develop a pretty comprehensive restoration plan. The Federal Council has a habitat committee that gets involved with habitat issues. When the Gulf Council considered our response to 
this committee's request for input relative to reauthorization of Magnuson Stevens, one of the things that we discussed and I led the charge was the importance of vegetated wetlands, the marshes, because basically all of the fishes at Federal Council is involved with man managing, basically all. There are some exceptions, the billfish and things, or estuarine dependent. The product productivity is from basically Pascagoula, Mississippi to Galveston, Texas, for the most part. Now, the pink shrimp are, are Florida, and spiny lobster are Florida, and stone crabs are Florida, but for all the other resources, the breadbasket of the Gulf of Mexico is, is in that zone, Pascagoula to Galveston, basically. That's the area, the central part of it, that's, that's, that's really been impacted by subsidence, erosion, call it what you will. If I get another two minutes, I'll, I'll try and give you a quick synopsis of... of, of you know, I think what I'd like to do is rather than hold everybody up, if you could stay after this hearing for two minutes, be I'd glad like to engage to. Thank you in, you. That, in that conversation. Uh, some of the questions for the, for the reauthorization of the act that we have that we want to sort of get clear before we put this thing together, um, one of them will deal with how each council uses science and what's the process upon which they um, access that information and then make a determination based on that, uh, um, uh, that biological assessment from the SSC and then the total allowable catch or the allocation that the council uh, goes forward with. So we want to take a look at the, an inside look about how each council deals with that scientific information, the uncertainty, when the SSC meets, how often they sit with the council, those kinds of things, um, to possibly put some type of, don't walk, don't stand up and leave now, to put some type of uniform standard based on the best system. So that, now, th that's out there. Uh, the other question I have is something that appeared in the Ocean Commission report, which I think we've discussed at least in part with some councils in the past, and that is um, should the councils comply, or I hate to use the word, could, should the councils be prohibited from setting the tack above the ABC as recommended by the SE, SSC? I'll just, if I could just get a quick answer on that. You can say yes, you can say no. Um, so, um, thank you. Would you would you like questions to both um, the SSC sure. composition and yes, and yes. okay? Yes. Um, in the case of the Western Pacific Council, um, we have a, a truly international um, scientific and statistical co committee. Um, just because of our geographic location um, and the fisheries that we interact with. Um, we have people um, from uh, Fiji, Tahiti, some of the island nations that, that are not um, part of the council area, but offer a, a unique perspective um, in relationship to our primary fisheries, which are pelagic fisheries, of course, which, which know no boundaries. Um, our SSC meets typically uh, between one and two weeks prior to a council meeting. Um, they review the science that's put before them and make recommendations to the council. And in our case, it's the council's position to uh, take that recommendation from the SSC and really apply a, um, a, a level of risk that they're willing to accept uh, of, of what a catch might be and say a 5% level of risk that, that we might exceed that catch. In the, in the Pacific, uh, in our particular council, we have no active fisheries that have, at this point, any quotas with the exception of, of a relatively small co quota uh, to the east of, of the Hawaiian Islands that's uh, part of an international treaty um, dealt with out of, out of really the San Diego office. So um, we don't have tax. So uh, you're, uh, you're fairly unique 
when it comes to the council process. Uh, yeah, and, and that's, I think that's my point is it, it's hard to, to address. So this would not necessarily apply to you? This, this whole idea of, uh, well, first of all, that, that's a good explanation and, and we'll, we'll, we'll pursue that further. But th this idea that the council should be prohibited from um, setting the TAC above the um, ABC. That, that isn't. It really doesn't, it yeah. doesn't play in, in yeah. any of the fisheries under the council's jurisdiction at this point. And not to say that it might not sometime in the future, it might, but um, right now that really I don't think applies to the Western Pacific and, and certainly our primary fisheries. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. The gentleman from the Caribbean. Were you hit by that storm? Did no. it affect the? No, luckily we, we didn't. Good. But we are bracing our stuff. The season is not over until November. We uh, have a similar situation as the, the Western Pacific due to the nature of our fisheries. Uh, in theory, when you have artisanal island fisheries, if your objective is maximize employment, you can f set a, a total allowable cash beyond them as well, and it will be there almost forever. However, the risk is that if something happened to the environment, the fishery collapse. Our council have taken uh, the decision of not maximizing employment in our fisheries. We don't have a DAC, however, uh, we usually, uh, usually not, we, we are not allowed as a policy in our council to go beyond what the scientists tell us if it's the maximum that we should fish for. Hmm. Uh, you also ask the way that we use science or the, or the mechanism. Uh, we mentioned the three, the three councils uh, of the Southeast region that we have adopted the Southeast Data Assessment and Review Program. And we also meet uh, the SSC when required. The chairman is always with us, but whenever we need to, to have uh, the blue ribbon type of scientists that we have in SSC and the Habitat Advisory Panel, we, we ask them to meet and provide the, the necessary input for the council. Uh, the problem that we have is, although we are in essence driven by science, is that we don't have the data that the scientists need to assess most of the species that we have. But yes, to your, your questions, uh, this is the way that, that we handle uh, science. And we have the, the ultimate decision maker uh, in terms of science now is the, the CDAC program because it's a peer review program where you have scientists interacting at the first level with fishermen just to check and balance. And then the third one is a peer review by scientists who make sure that the best available data and methodology is used for our decision making process. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Yes, uh, on the scientific processes, uh, our councils like the New England Council we use uh, what's called the saw sark process where the stock assessment data is uh, developed, uh, the figures in, a in the stock assessment workshop, and these are scientists that do this from the state, the regional states and the National Marine Fishery Service and some universities. Then this data is uh, reviewed by the SARC or the Stock Assessment Review Committee, which is uh, comprised of the independent experts from the NOAA Center for Independent Expertise. So we feel that that data, by the time it's re done that system, it has been uh, very robustly uh, and rigorously reviewed. Uh, so we do not normally engage our formally constituted scientific and statistical committee. Uh, that's brought in more for a broad overview type items. However, th in the Mid-Atlantic Council, when we get the data uh, from the SAW-SARC process and the staff makes recommendations, it then goes to our monitoring committee, which, as I said, are like species SSCs. Uh, and th these monitoring committees are compro comprised of fishery scientists from the states, from the National Marine Fishery Service, from the universities, and they're particularly expert in that species, possibly, or in the techniques used to develop the stock assessments. And they come, uh, come up with recommendations. 
then the Species Monitoring Committee of the Council reviews all the information, makes their recommendations. The Council, and in turn, reviews all the information and makes their recommendations that goes to NIMS. So uh, we feel that while we don't use the formally constituted scientific and statistical committee like the North Pacific does, their data does not undergo the review through a saw sark process uh, and a monitoring committee like ours it does in the Mid-Atlantic Council. As far as councils being allowed to set uh, catches above ABCs, uh, I would say for our council, I can't remember that ever happening. Uh, we might, for a year, it might be uh, above a recommendation, but then we would go with a constant harvest strategy for a number of years. So at the end, say at three years, we would have met the prerequisite uh, of staying under the ABC. And also by uh, through a court case, we're kind of restricted. We have to meet or have a 50 percent probability of meeting uh, the rebuilding schedule before we can or to set any of these total ball allocable catches. Mm -hmm. Now I will say that if the data is uh, less uh, reliable than we normally set our the catch limits at a, with a more risk adverse uh, policy. If we're sure the data is pretty good, then we might push it right to the number recommended. If it's uh, not that good, then we might set it below what we could just because we're not sure. Thank you very much. Um, the other question, um, if you could just respond briefly, um, an eco, we, we want to begin pushing the concept of an ecosystem fisheries management system. We don't want to push it so hard that it's not going to work. We don't want to push it in a way that, that the councils are subject to lawsuits because they can't meet a deadline or something like that. But we want to pursue the concept of an ecosystem fisheries management con idea. Can you uh, just give us your um, comment on an ecosystem approach versus a single species management plan? Um, in the case of the Western Pacific, we have one existing ecosystem management plan for coral reefs. Um, in addition, we're, we feel kind of uh, at least out in front in that we are in the process of developing ecosystem management plans for four other ecosystems. Um, again, because of the geographic region that we're in, it's somewhat diverse, and, and so development of ecosystem management plans for the uh, Hawaiian archipelago, uh, American Samoa, and the Guam Northern Marianas archipelago, archipelago have also been in the process for some time. Um, in addition to that, the Western Pacific is developing the last ecosystem plan, which will um, entail the pelagic species. That one's quite complicated, but it'll be a single plan that, that in covers the entire region. Um, um, so that's where the Western Pacific is um, as related to FEPs. Thank you. In, in our case, we prepared an ecosystem-based management plan in the 70s. So I guess we were ahead of our time because it was disapproved. It was not fishy enough. Now we're back into the ecosystem-based management approach, and our concept, in, in the nature of our fisheries, they are all multi-species. So we have to consider ecosystem-based management for everything that we do in our FMPs. The recently uh, submitted uh, SFA amendment encompasses all the species that we have close environment, the, the EFH. And although it's not named ecosystem management plan, it's all based on the ecosystem-based management. Uh, one point, if I may, is that the ecosystem is always look at from a point of view of biology. And we have to integrate also the socioeconomics so they are all part of the community, are part of the ecosystem. So yes, we, in, in, the, in our case, we, we support the idea and we are moving to uh, work more in that direction than, than before. Thank you very much. Mr. Smith. Uh, I 
see us moving towards ecosystem management, but it's going to be a slow evolutionary process. I mean, there's a lot of discussion now about uh, the reason we don't have weak fish, maybe cod fish or things like that, is because we have a great abundance of striped bass and spiny dogfish, and all, and that's these animals are eating the other animals that we might want to see the stocks recover. Uh, but until we get scientific information, this is all conjecture, and uh, we can't say. So there is a need to move towards ecosystem management so that we can have the answers to questions like this. But uh, one thing in ecosystem management is the total ecosystem. Currently, the councils can only control fishermen, and uh, there's probably more than a few fish stocks in the Mid-Atlantic area that are the most serious impacts on their recovery are not overfishing. It's uh, development or pollution or something like that. Maybe we, we could put the council in charge of the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Development Project. I'm not. And we'll just give you guys the total authority. Uh, well Save I, don't, those I don't know if we want to be in that hot seat, <laughs> but. Uh, put Dan in charge of that. Certainly, certainly, uh, in going to ecosystem management, uh, there has to other uh, other factors, factors have to be considered. Right, uh, cons have to be considered other than just fishing pressure. Thank you very much, Mr. I have a few more questions. I don't know. I want to. Uh, my time is up. I don't know if uh, Henry, if you have any questions. I'm certainly uh, you know interested in listening to your questions. I know that uh, this is you chair this committee that deals with this particular issue and. Uh, uh, we we don't want to wear out the panel, but uh, I'm certainly for listening to uh, some more I got questions. I a few more, if it's okay. Sure, okay. Go, go, go for it. Thank you. If you, each of you could give me a perspective on your um, feelings about IFQs. Is that something that would be useful to put in the toolbox um, with, with, you know, certain guidelines and standards so that you could make those available if it was uh, appropriate for your region. Um, in the case of the Western Pacific, I certainly think that, that IFQs um, could have a place um, and should be included in the, in the toolbox. Currently, we, we don't have any fisheries that I um, think would benefit from that um, that are in council jurisdiction. There's, there's some issues uh, within state waters and some of the smaller fisheries where where um, that may be applicable. But I, I certainly wouldn't preclude having IS, IFQs from, from being available to us in the toolbox um, should they be the, the uh, management measure that makes the most sense for, for a specific fishery. Thank you. Roland? Yes, <coughs> definitely we would like to have uh, as many tools as we can get. In, in our case, we are moving now with working with the fishers, and they are interested in uh, limited access privilege, that's the phrase they use now, limited entry or rationalization of the fisheries, and we are just beginning. The community is beginning to understand all these concepts. So uh, in the past, we tried with one particular species, but uh, it was too complicated. Mm. Mr. Smith. Uh, yes, uh, I believe, well, speaking for myself anyway, I strongly support uh, having IFQs in the toolbox. Uh, as you know, we already have one uh, fishery to surf clams and ocean clogs that are managed by individual transferable quotas. And uh, while it's not a perfect system, it certainly uh, is more efficient economically and biologically uh, than what was present before we had the ITQs. And in fisheries that uh, where the fishermen want IFQs, I think it's an excellent way to go. And uh, I think it should be in a toolbox. Thank you very much. Um, the, I asked the last panel about um, essential fish habitat and what's in the statute now uh, over the last, I guess it's been nine years since that was, has it been nine years? About nine years. Um, do you see in any way that we should modify the language that's in the Magnuson Act right now as far as essential fish habitat is concerned? 
Um, I, th I think in the case of our, our region, essential fish habitat, um, the way it's currently in the, in the rules, um, serves our needs. That's not to say that that, that might change as well. Um, but um, currently we have um, pretty prohibitive restrictions related to some of the fisheries that might impact habitat, such as no trawling in, in without the, within the entire region and some of those things. So um, we're addressing the essential fish habitat um, currently, and, and uh, um, I think it works for us. So EFH hasn't been a burden for developing it, your fisheries plan? It, it, no, it really hasn't. I, I, I would say no. Thank you. Mr. Rowland? Well, first of all, I'm afraid to, to ask something that I may regret to get after oh, I well, get it. Well, it's, I, but we say things up here all the time that we regret. Sometimes we're happy we say them. Sometimes <laughs> we're not happy. Yeah, I know. The but important uh, thing is to just, just say it, and we're not going to do it. The story of our council with EFH is, as I said before, we we just finished the, the a product that incorporates all the EFH mandate. But the EFH was nothing but a requirement to describe the, the essential fish habitat. And perhaps we need some other agencies to pay attention to what the councils identify as essential fish habitat so we can protect that habitat better. Uh, That's it. Thank you. That's very, very interesting. Like other agencies, like the Corps of Engineers, or, or yeah, uh, the uh, local and, and uh, other agencies. That whenever a council is asked to provide our inputs, and we tell them you need to preserve or conserve this habitat because it's it's needed for fishery, uh, they just thank you. But it's it's very difficult then. Five years from now, you see the hotel in the place that we have uh, not to build a hotel. Right. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Uh, yes. Uh, EFH is in the MS, uh, Magnus Stevens Act now, is all right for council uh, action, but I don't think it would hurt to broaden it to include other users or impactors of, of essential fish habitat. In other words, again, we can only manage fishing, and it might not be that uh, fishermen are the one destroying the essential fish habitat. It's some other uh, entity. And also, I would say there's probably uh, a big gap in the adequate knowledge of uh, essential fish habitat, especially in uh, the EEZ. Uh, and so additional funding would be uh, very helpful to acquire the knowledge to have a better understanding of how the different entities, fishing and development and offshore oil, whatever, is imp actually impacting the essential fish habitat. Thank you. Um, many of you during the course of the day have mentioned um, <coughs> NEPA and uh, its, um, you know, burdensome paperwork, uh, lawsuits and all of those things. Um, would, would you recommend that we at least look at some process where NEPA can be integrated into the Magnuson-Stevens process in its development of a fisheries management plan? Um, certainly in my oral testimony and written as well, um, that, that is um, something that, that I think, I won't speak for all the councils, but certainly our councils support. Um, there's so much uh, uh, dupli duplicative requirements, you've got um, two people doing basically the same uh, same type of work, but for different reasons, but, but the results are very similar. So um, we would support a uh, somehow integrating the NEPA requirements into MSA so that so that we can be more expeditious uh, and efficient in doing doing the job that we're required to do. Thank you. Mr. Roll. Definitely we, we support that that statement and uh, also, we need to, to make some sense out of it. N NEPA is a process that we all need. But when you go and have to explain why you hooking a dolphin fish will never touch a coral reef to a judge, because NEPA requires to do that. And every time you have a different hook, you have to explain it in three different ways with 30 pages each. Uh, that's what's really killing them. And 
when we started, we, th we thought that we were the good guys, that we were doing everything according to NEPA under the Madison Act. But now it's becoming more complicated, and it's affecting the way that we do the work because the people do not understand it. When you go to a group of fishermen, a group of politicians, a group of local people with 200 pages and a summary, they cannot read it and they understand it. But the next time around, you, you go there with 1,000 pages. Everything is in there, but it's buried there. Uh, as I was accused of public hearings, and my poor chairman almost sat and fed out of the meeting, they couldn't understand it why. And, and that's really, we are not uh, saying that we should be exempt, well, some people do, exempt from NEPA. NEPA is there to stay. It's a process that we all need. And it's a process that we need to clear the atmosphere so everybody understands what we're doing and where we're coming from. But uh, integration and streamlining of the NEPA process with the MSA, I, I believe, and we all believe, this is the way to go. Thank you. Mr. Smith? Uh, the short answer is yes, definitely. But uh, I think uh, if NEPA just, if certain, a, a couple things in the Mag and Stephen Act could be incorporated and then we would get the, an exemption because I don't think NEPA was ever created to uh, have the effect that it has on something like the Magnus and Stevens Act. Uh, it was for a significant federal action, uh, and I don't think that uh, setting annual specifications for uh, a catch, things like that, are significant federal actions as originally thought of under NEPA. I see. Thank you. I th I, this may be the last question. <laughs> Um, the National Marine Sanctuaries Act, could you give us some idea of where it is in conflict with Magnuson, Mr. Martin? Um, certainly in the case of, of the Sanctuaries Act and how I'm most familiar with it, which is, which is the ongoing designation of the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. Um, the, the act, it's, uh, the act itself isn't a problem and a sanctuary uh, may very well be um, the right thing. I think that the, the, the disconnect between the sanctuary folks and um, the fisheries folks is in managing fisheries. Um, the fisheries have, have uh, the fisheries councils and National Marine Fisheries Service have traditionally um, conducted fishery management and scientific activities. And in fact, I think they're the producer of most of the science in, in uh, um, the proposed sanctuary in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands and others. Um, the councils, I believe, have a concern that the sanctuary's uh, designation will result in the removal of fishery management from NOAA fisheries and uh, have it replaced by uh, National Ocean Sanctuary, uh, National Sanctuaries um, folks. and. Um, we're very concerned about that. The industry is very concerned about that. Um, the sanctuaries folks um, have specific jobs that they need to do for the sanctuary. Um, and from a fishery perspective, we feel that maybe they don't have as broad a background as might be um, required to actually manage fisheries within a sanctuary, which, which of course are allowed. So um, from at least our experience is we think it's very important that fishery management be retained within the National Marine Fisheries Service um, sanctum and not, not transfer to sanctuaries um, because they do the science. They, they, they have the information. So. Thank you very much. Mr. Rowland? Um, <coughs> just to give you an idea, in Spanish, sanctuary is something that you put a bunch of signs there, you don't touch it. And when we tried to have a sanctuary implemented in Puerto Rico, uh, we created a hell of a problem. People didn't understand what it was <clears throat> because the fisher thought that we, uh, they all were, were, were going to be kicked out of the area, that we couldn't do anything with, with that area. And that, I bring that as, a, as an example following his presentation of the problem that we have. And, uh, I believe that <clears throat> the two acts are necessary but the fishery management should rest on the people who really f know about fishery management, uh, which is the, the council. And we need more integration of the way these two acts work together. But the way it is now, 
it is at the discretion of Amit or Lautenberger. And we need some tools there, maybe some regulations or, or new laws that will mandate this uh, consultation with the, with the fishery managers whenever you have a, a sanctuary. Also, we would like to see the decision-making process with the National uh, Marine Sanctuary Act. Uh, cons consult with the councils at the beginning when you start, when you start thinking about a sanctuary, not at the end, you know, four or five slots at the end of the, of the chart where sometimes it's late uh, for us to be able to be effective in our input. And sometimes when you get to that, to that stage, everybody and his brother <coughs> are against fisheries without any real rationale behind it, without any science. It's just that this is a so get the hell out. And when we do something like that, we have a strong rationale or a good scientific rationale, not only we step in the toes of commercial fishermen, but also recreational fishermen. And you want those people against you. They are powerful people. So if we do not have a tool that will allow us to better implement the Manuson Act in conjunction with the National Sanctuary Act, it will not be a better, the best for the, for the nation, the better benefit of the nation. We will create so many conflicts that will result in probably the opposite of what we want to do <coughs> with our resources. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Fortunately, in our area, we don't have uh, big marine sanctuaries. In fact, the only one I'm aware of. But in listening to other uh, council areas, uh, it seems that the way it, it is right now, there's a par power struggle between the two entities, the council and the marine sanctuary, for con total control of the area. And uh, maybe if there was some kind of joint or coordinated management of fisheries and other uh, things in the area, and as Miguel said, uh, if the fishery councils were involved early on and, the, and that the sanctuary people understood that the fisheries uh, management in the area would be uh, done by the councils, uh, then there'd be less, uh, maybe less of a feeling that all the sanctuary group had to do was just contact the councils and check that box and then they could go on and do as they pleased. The other thing, uh, if, if uh, we have a lot of marine sanctuaries in an area and there's no thought given to ecosystem management, then it is, it's going to be very piecemeal, and uh, I would think uh, defeat or somewhat defeat the ecosystem management principles that might uh, be uh, be more useful in a, in a large area. So you're saying we need more sanctuaries and more ecosystem management plans? No, I didn't oh, say no. that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just wanted to clarify that. All right, well, gentlemen, thank you very much. It's been uh, very insightful. Mr. Chairman, thank well, you. Thank Are we you. going to take a recess now before we come back? <laughs> I don't know if we got any, any other bells run going off or anything, so I assume that we can just conclude this meeting today. And but thank you very much to the panel for uh, such an informative briefing. And, and uh, with that, I would like to say um, thanks to the witnesses and ask unanimous consent that members have the opportunity to submit questions for the record. And uh, this hearing is adjourned.